chronic osteomyelitis principles kind of um, flew through a little bit. Um, and, and this is important that you um, recognize um, bone stability does not necessarily uh, mean fixation. There are some osteomyelitis that you're going to treat and to breed that the bone already is stable and you're not going to have to do anything. Um, there are others that you may gain stability on a temporary basis with something like an external fixator. Coverage you should at least understand. You may well elect not to provide it yourself. It's perfectly fine to um, have a plastic surgeon do your um, extremity flaps, but in general you guys will um, understand the extremity better than they do and at least on an intellectual basis you may well find that you're very helpful in determining um, coverage types for um, some of your patients. Subacute osteomyelitis is a very common question. It's one that um, they like, um, also called Brody's abscess. Uh, patients present with pain. They have no systemic signs or symptoms. Femur and tibia are the most common sites. It's one of the lesions that can be in the physis. Um, so when you see a physeal lesion in a child, things other than chondroblastomas um, should cross your mind and you may well see more Brody's abscesses than chondroblastomas over a period of time. An example of a Brody's abscess that was referred in to me to evaluate for tumor, showing a lucent lesion in the proximal tibia, nice rim of reactive bone, um, suggesting a relatively chronic kind of condition, a T1 um, MRI sequence showing all of the edema, which is relatively low signal on T1 weighted images and the reactive bone um, surrounding it. Um, with a little um, abscess cavity within the, the uh, midst of it. Um, by and large, if it's recognized and um, treated, it's a relatively benign process. There are a couple of variant osteomyelitis that get asked on the test. Um, like a lot of things that get asked on the test, their test importance seems to be um, greater than their real importance. Chronic sclerosing osteomyelitis um, is a <clears throat> disease of the diaphyses, usually the tibia of adolescence. There is dense periosteal new bone formation. It is painful and resistant to treatment. Chronic multifocal osteomyelitis occurs in younger children tends to be uh, metaphyseal or um, it likes the clavicle um, and it tends to not be resistant to treatment and will um, spontaneously um, resolve. The issues with both of these more than anything else are recognition. There are some uh, specialized infections that always get play on the test. Um, Watch out for serratia and IV drug abusers. It tends to be an axial skeleton lesion. Uh, Pseudomonas occurs in IV drug abusers and in puncture wounds through tennis shoes. Um, brucella is a gram negative that occurs in meat packers and is classic for flat bones, especially the spine. Um, anaerobes occur from skin infections and from bites. Uh, fungi occur um, following skin infections and are common in the immunocompromised host. And the most common that you will bump into being candida, particularly in um, ICU patients. And uh, mycobacteria, um, remember to check the PPD. They are granulomatous on x-ray, tend to be caseating granulomas as opposed to sarcoidosis, which is a non-caseating granuloma treated with um, tuberculosis drugs. Infected joint replacement um, was covered um, this morning uh, and um, I think we will um, leave it at that. Um, clenched fist injuries. Um, 
assume them to be an injury to um, the MP joint generally, um, if you see a clenched fist injury, generally occurs from somebody hitting someone else in the mouth, um, should um, operatively explore it um, and watch for extensor tendon lacerations and for um, joint injuries. Tetanus, um, by and large, is handled in the emergency rooms who are um, very much sensitized to it, uh, but something that you should um, be cognizant of. Um, it is a neuroparalytic uh, disease. It occurs as a, an effect of an exotoxin from Clostridium tetani. It tends to occur in old, deep, and contaminated wounds. If people have had tetanus prophylaxis within five years, they probably don't need to be reprophylaxed. If they don't know or are convinced they haven't had it, then think prophylaxis. Uh, rabies um, occurs as a virus in animal saliva. It is common in bats, foxes, skunks, raccoons, dogs, and cats. Uh, largely, from a clinical perspective, at least in the East, the raccoon um, is the problem. They are said to be 40 times, have 40 times the population density in the suburbs that they have in the wild. Um, they um, like neighborhoods, they thrive in neighborhoods, and people come into contact with um, raccoons. On the other hand, bats are common carriers, but people don't, by and large, come into them. Um, contact with bats. Um, uh, presents as a neuroparalytic neuro disease, again, with central nervous system irritation, paralysis, and death. The um, treatment involves both vaccine and rabies immune um, globulin. Um, hoofed animals don't tend to get it, and um, rodents don't tend to um, be carriers of um, rabies. Foot puncture wounds occur through the sole of tennis shoes, uh, generally a nail. They're common. Staph um, is the most common bug, but Pseudomonas is the characteristic bug and the bug that usually uh, is sought in terms of questioning. Uh, osteomyelitis will develop in about 1% to 2% of people who get a nail puncture wound through the sole of a tennis shoe. Diabetic foot infections are um, potentially very severe infections, as you know, leading to a large number of amputations uh, nationwide. Uh, mild infections tend to be gram-positive cocci, like most everything else. Uh, se severe infections, though, are polymicrobial, require um, rapid um, and aggressive um, uh, incisions and drainages and debridements. Uh, and the um, antibiotics need to uh, cover uh, multiple organisms. Uh, necrotizing and, fa and fasciitis and gas gangrene are potential accompaniments of diabetic foot infections. Uh, Perinechia um, is common. You see them regularly. Uh, they come, though, in several varieties, which you should be aware of. Um, the majority will be a staph infection. Dentist um, and um, dental hygienist, though, will get herpes, um, perinechia, and dishwashers whose hands are wet all the time. And this must be sneaking up on a disease of antiquity with all of the um, mechanical dishwashers now. Um, will get candida and um, needs to be thought about. And if you have someone with that occupational history, should be um, looked at with um, appropriate stains. Fungal infections are infections by multicellular organisms as opposed to single cell bacteria. Um, they can induce a hypersensitivity reaction. They create a granulomatous infection, um, but grossly can look like an abscess. Um, treatment is generally debridement and antifungal agents um, will be covered more under joints. Uh, HIV, you are going to get questioned on somehow or another. Um, it is 
uh, not only common, but um, it, it is politically favored. And, and you are going to get questions on HIV. There's a recent article, again, in the TAN Journal um, on HIV occurs in um, homosexual males, particularly IV drug abusers, and um, huge instance in hemophiliacs associated with a diminished number of CD4 or helper T cells. Uh, diagnosis of AIDS is a uh, patient is HIV positive and has an opportunistic infection or HIV positive and has a CD4 count of um, less than um, 200. Um, this is something that in a general practice you're going to bump into. The, there are people out there. Uh, last time I went to Key West, in fact, when I was checking into my hotel, somebody walked by the desk clerk and asked him how he was doing. He said his CD4 count was up. And it just there's a lot of HIV positivity out there, as you all are aware. Uh, HIV risk, um, you know, I don't know what the risk to attending orthopedic surgeons is, but I must get stuck at least once a quarter by a resident with a needle. Um, the, the incidence is said to be 0.3%. Um, I haven't seen the reference. One of you may have, but one of the last residents that stuck me said that she'd read an article that said it had probably not been reported as a needle stick through gloves. Um, and um, I hope that's true. Um, uh, as occur, it occurs as a risk of blood transfusion. Newest number I've seen actually is higher than that. It's probably closer to one in one and a half million, I think, um, similar to the allograft instance with um, more modern testing. At any rate, the incidence is low, but something y'all are all aware of. There are other entities, though, associated with HIV that um, haven't as far as I recall, shown up on in-training yet, but you would think they're bound to be showing up um, any time with uh, the recent um, literature in the Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Um, they get um, soft tissue infections, um, pyomyositis, um, can be tricky because of the AZT myopathy. They can get osteomyelitis, um, bacillary angiomatosis associated with Bartonella, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and Kaposi's sarcomas, y'all are well aware of, I'm sure. And there are a number of inflammatory arthritic conditions associated with HIV um, and AIDS um, that um, I'm not sure it is something that will be specifically um, ask, asking someone to tell the difference between HIV-associated arthritis and acute symmetric polyarthritis, but I would think it would be reasonably fair to ask about joint inflammation. Hepatitis, uh, again, everybody should be aware of, and I haven't spent much effort on this. Hepatitis A is due to poor sanitation and is not generally a surgical problem. B and C, though, clearly are um, surgical problems. Um, bear in mind that um, healthcare workers can be carriers of hepatitis B. Testing is not um, uh, as effective with hepatitis as it is with HIV at this point. The hepatitis C virus um, continually changes its um, genome to some degree, making um, testing obsolete almost as soon as um, a test is identified. Antibiotics for open fractures, um, you may well um, get asked about. Uh, one and two, op grade one and two open fractures, Everybody agrees that a first-generation cephalosporin is a good drug. There is some question, especially in twos, whether the addition of gram-negative coverage with an amino glycoside um, is also needed. Uh, the answer at the moment, though, I think is first-generation cephalosporin. With grade three A's, um, clearly an amino glycoside is um, indicated. Um, in, um, 
uh, three Bs. Uh, the mechanism of the injury needs to be thought about if it is a horribly contaminated contaminated wound with soil and the like, then the addition of gram-negative coverage um, for clostridia is um, recommended. And if it is an injury that occurs um, in water, um, uh, then consideration of pseudomonas coverage uh, should be considered. Um, antibiotic mechanisms of action. Um, Again, should be medical school um, stuff, and I'm going to go through relatively quickly. Uh, the common antibiotics that we use a lot, cephalosporins, inhibit cell wall synth synthesis, as does uh, vancomycin and bacitracin. Um, Beta-lactamase resistance you are aware of with penicillin. Increasing cell wall permeability. Um, if you're in a fungus belt particularly or treating ICU patients, you may well be using um, amphotericin. Um, ribosomal inhibition, um, uh, genomycin, tobramycin. Um, tobramycin, you're especially going to be using um, making antibiotic beads. It has um, good antibiotic elution um, characteristics. It, they can bind more than just the 30. They can bind the 50, 70, or 80 S subunits as well and cause a misread of messenger RNA. Ribosomal inhibition drugs are mostly gram-negative drugs. Um, some drugs affect DNA tran no S, transcription and translation. Um, quinolones are um, derivatives of nalodixic acid. They have a very broad spectrum. There is increasing resistance, unfortunately. Uh, bear in mind the problem in children of tendon ruptures, um, and you really can't use um, the Cipro um, and the other quinolones um, in children. Uh, rifampin, uh, which you will use some with um, Coag negative staff inhibits RNA polymerase. Um, metronidazole forms oxygen radicals. They're probably not going to be interested in that drug. Again, mechanisms of action um, we've gone over. Side effects are important. Aminoglycosides, um, you worry about the ears and the kidneys. Um, tetracycline stains teeth. It should be used. Um, uh, with reservation in children, not much orthopedic um, implication. Uh, cephalosporins tend to be relatively non-toxic, um, which makes them um, um, excellent drugs for, um, for orthopedic use. And the last thing that we are going to do, and hopefully finish early enough for um, questions on um, all of this stuff um, is by far the biggest topic that I have to cover. It's on normal and diseased joints. Um, Y'all have, it's chapter two, I think, in the Miller Review book, and it is a long involved chapter with a lot of um, material and a lot of very popular material on the test. Um, the first part of the lecture is going to once again, unfortunately, go to pure basic science. Um, so here I am banging my head on the wall again. Um, the second two-thirds of the lecture is going to be largely clinical, talking about joint diseases, uh, which should, I hope, be more fun. There are several types of joints, um, syndesmoses, synchondroses, and diarthrodial joints, um, which um, you should be aware of. Uh, synchondroses include the intervertebral disc, the cartilage tends to be fibrocartilage, and motion tends to be limited. Diarthrodial joints contain articular cartilage, a capsule, a synovial membrane, are the classic joints that we spend most of our time uh, dealing with. Articular cartilage does have um, zonation to it, and this is a common uh, concept that they test on. Uh, the very uppermost layer has cartilage fibers oriented parallel to the surface of the joint. The chondrocytes are elongated and parallel to each other. 
there is relatively little proteoglycan and relatively a lot of water in that layer and its primary function uh, as you would expect is um, shear resistance. The middle zone has collagen fibers of a larger diameter. They're not very well organized. They're not parallel like they are in the upper zone or perpendicular like they are in the next zone. Um, the chondrocytes are rounded. Uh, proteoglycan levels increase and this primarily serves as resistance to compression. The deep zone has large collagen fibers which are oriented perpendicular to the joint surface. The chondrocytes are columnar. This is the highest level of proteoglycans and water levels are low and again this functions um, primarily in a compression mode. The zone of calcified cartilage is um, marked by the tide mark, which is an H&E staining phenomenon. It has a cartilage matrix, but there are apatitic salts within it. Uh, the cells tend to be um, small and is felt to um, have shear properties. Chondrocyte is the um, functional cell of articular cartilage. It serves to form and maintain the extracellular matrix of the cartilagen, cartilage. It is responsive to growth factors, interleukins, drugs, loads, and pressure changes. There is not a nerve supply, and um, immunoglobulins are too large to pass into it, so there is um, a relatively um, little immune responsiveness. The composition is mostly water. 65 to 80% water varies with age. Um, collagen is type 2, bone collagen is type 1. They tend to um, ask that. Um, is the next largest component after water. And the um, major proteoglycan called agrican um, forms 4 to 7 percent of it. Again, um, to some degree age dependent. There are a variety of um, smaller components which in total make up less than 5% of the articular cartilage. Water has a high concentration superficially and a relatively lower concentration deep. Water content increases with osteoarthritis, another question they ask. The water can be moved by a pressure gradient or by um, compression. Proteoglycans are hydrophilic and tend to hold water. Um, collagens, again, they like to ask, um, type 1 is your primary or collagen in bone, type 2 is your primary um, collagen in um, cartilage, um, uh, type 10 is one that they sometimes look for, which is seen um, in um, hypertrophic cartilage, and type 9 is involved in the cross-linking of um, cartilage is another one they sometimes look for. Collagen gives the articular cartilage its tensile and shear properties. It immobilizes proteoglycans in the extracellular matrix. It is a triple helix um, and is cross-linked. There is a great deal of glycine proline and hydroxyproline in um, the collagen which can be measured as breakdown products uh, in people who have um, cartilage diseases. Again, it, it is a chained um, uh, substance formed in a triple helix, has the um, whole zones um, that, that I'm sure Dr. Shabra talked about um, yesterday, as it also forms the um, structural unit of bone and, and serves mineralization um, functions there. Proteo proteoglycans give the cartilage its compressive strength. There are several common um, glycosaminoglycan subunits. And this is another one that they like to ask. Uh, chondroitin 4-sulfate is more common in young people. I think this was on last year's in training. It decreases with age. Chondroitin 6-sulfate and keratin sulfate tend to increase with age. The um, glycosaminoglycan uh, unit's uh, size decreases with aging and decrease uh, with osteoarthritis. 
The basic structure is the hyaluronate um, strand. There is a link protein. Um, the um, glycosaminoglycan um, subunits are attached to a protein core. Um, and again, this picture or some semblance of it tends to show up on a um, very regular um, basis. Remember the keratin sulfate decreases with age, chondroitin sulfates increase with age. The molecular organization is that the glycosaminoglycans are intermixed with the um, collagen which help to uh, maintain them and uh, to give them structural uh, support. Chondrocyte metabolism is mostly anaerobic. Um, children have some aerobic um, chondrocyte metabolism early. Um, they synthesize a symbol and basically maintain the extracellular matrix, respond to chemical and environmental stimuli. They are a, the cartilage is avascular. Its nutrition is primarily diffusion from synovial fluid. Um, uh, you see that clinically with cartilage tumors which can easily seed a biopsy site because they don't need a blood supply to survive. Uh, diffusion times are relatively um, lengthy but the metabolism is relatively low. Interleukins growth factors and prostaglandins move freely in the cartilage but as noted earlier immunoglobulins don't. The cartilage uh, Shouldn't let old people play with computers. Um, cartilage, uh, the proteoglycans are formed through the standard manner of protein synthesis. Uh, the proteins assembled in the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, go to the Golgi apparatus where they're put into secretory vessel, vesicles and go out into the um, intercellular matrix where they are uh, measurable. There they are um, organized into the um, subunit shape. Um, they're catabolized. Um, interleukins are toxic. Immobilization, as you know, is bad for cartilage. The cleavage splits tend to be at the G1 and G2 domains. Um, and again, those fragments once, once split are immeasurable, which may become um, clinically useful as time goes by. Um, collagen, um, remember, is vitamin C dependent for hydroxylization and that gets asked um, every once in a while on the various tests. Growth factors are popular. A um, lot we don't know. Um, we're in the infancy of using them clinically. They regulate cartilage synthesis. There are a lot of different types of growth factors and they may play a role in primary osteoarthritis. Uh, degradative enzymes are numerous and that is in part how the cartilage gets broken down. Proteolytic enzymes um, are um, formed by the chondrocyte. Uh, common uh, proteolytic enzymes are the metalloproteinases and the metal that they have in common is zinc, um, which again is something that is liked. Um, cartilage ages like the rest of us unfortunately does. Um, young cartilage is more cell cellular. Um, mitotic activity decreases or ceases with advancing age. Young cartilage has <clears throat> less collagen and more proteoglycan and more chondroitin-4 sulfate. So this picture is again from the Academy book showing very young cartilage with um, lots of um, proteoglycan, um, lots of um, uh, mitotic activity relatively speaking. As one ages the amount of proteoglycan markedly diminishes and the activity of the cells um, again markedly um, diminishes or, or ceases with age. Cartilage is permeable. It um, loses fluid with compression. 
The proteoglycan holds the water, so the more proteoglycan the person has, the less permeable their cartilage is. Um, in osteoarthritis, there's proteoglycan loss and water increase, so it is more permeable. Viscoelasticity is a concept that uh, is almost always um, looked for. It is a um, characteristic of articular cartilage in which there is a time-dependent um, motion. Um, as one applies a constant pressure to the cartilage, the cartilage changes shape. Um, uh, shear properties, obviously um, cartilage has to have shear properties. Our joints move and there is shear of one surface on another. In normal cartilage, uh, the amount of um, friction is virtually um, none. Uh, in pure shear, which um, uh, may or may not truly exist, um, there really isn't any volume change in the cartilage. There's intermolecular friction with perhaps a shape change, but um, in pure shear, there is not um, truly a volume-dependent deformation. Uh, swelling occurs um, with loss of proteoglycans, so that again, osteoarthritic cartilage um, is swollen with a higher water content. Cartilage is aneural, does not have a nerve supply. Monocytes and immunoglobulins are too big to penetrate it. Um, it responds to loading, unloading, um, and to biochemical and biomechanical changes. Unloading cartilage causes atrophy. Prolonged immobilization is bad for cartilage. Uh, the cartilage degenerates. The proteoglycans are lost more rapidly than the um, collagen. Abnormally increased loads and abnormal motion are also detrimental. Uh, you all know that in talking about people with cruciate deficient knees who have abnormal motion and um, develop um, arthritic changes as time goes by. And that is, I think, the end of the pure basic science. And now we're going to be back talking about um, some clinical entities. Uh, we're going to talk about arthritis or arthroses. Um, they occur in a variety of types, all of which um, we should be able to get through over um, the next hour and a half. Um, Joint fluid analysis is important. Uh, you will get asked questions on joint fluid analysis uh, regularly. Almost always it involves infection or gout, uh, but could involve other disease entities. Um, someone has said that they think that uh, analyzing joint fluid is more important in joints than a urinalysis is in evaluating renal disease. It's especially important in monoarticular arthritis, uh, and in particular, you're looking um, to be sure that you don't miss an infection. It's said that in a rheumatology practice, evaluation of the joint fluid may change the clinical impression in as many as 20% of um, patients, and it may give a clue as to a new problem in an established patient. Joint fluid is an ultrafiltrate of plasma, um, it has a fair amount of hyaluronate in it and smaller amounts of um, other proteins including fibrinogen complement and various globulins. Uh, joint fluid analysis is something that you will um, be involved with on a regular basis. Of course, the most common uh, main the thing that we look at is um, evaluating for infection. Uh, in general, there is an increased amount of joint fluid. Uh, viscosity may not be increased. Um, ideally, uh, there should be 100,000 or more white cells with 85% polys, although that's not always the um, case. Um, sugar um, measurements probably are not particularly useful. In a normal joint, in the knee, for instance, ideally there's less than one millimeter of joint fluid. So that when you're seeing patients in clinic and you aspirate a knee and you get five, six, eight millimeters of um, normal looking fluid, that is still a knee that's responding to something. The viscosity is high, meaning it's thick. 
Um, classic measurement is to put some between your fingers and see if it sticks to them. Um, generally not many white blood cells at all in normal joint fluid. The problem becomes when you're dealing with the inflamed patient who is not septic. And there is some overlap between um, the septic joint and the inflamed, for instance, gouty joint. Um, and uh, if you aren't facile at doing it, at least there needs to be somebody around who is facile at looking for crystals because you often will bump into the clinical problem of an acute gouty flare versus a septic joint in the emergency room. Um, polarized light is used to look for crystals. Um, birefringence um, is the property. Monosodium urate crystals are yellow when the crystal axis is parallel to the compensator. There are also little needle-shaped crystals. Uh, this yellow um, parallel is called negative birefringence. Uh, calcium pyrophosphate disease, the other common inflammatory crystal that you bump into, on the other hand, is blue when the crystal axis is parallel to the compensator. It tends to be short and squatty as opposed to needle-like, uh, and the blueness is positive by refringents. So that here is the typical um, gouty crystal, and this picture either came from one of the self-assessment exams or from one of the in-training exams. So, um, you know, this is something that they look for. The CPBD crystal is, um, as I say, not needle-shaped and tends to be blue or positively birefringent uh, when parallel to the compensator. There are other crystals. Um, uh, the one that you will uh, deal with most commonly, I think, is the steroid crystal. And you may never look at one. Um, I'm not sure I have. Um, uh, but when you give people intraarticular um, and ligamentous and tendinous and stuff steroid injections, which you're going to do, some of those people will get a steroid flare. And that is a crystal-induced synovitis. The salvation to it is that the crystal soluble and it's self-limited and goes away. But you're going to get phone calls at night from people that you give cortisone shots to wondering why they hurt like crazy. And then that's um, from the steroid going in in a crystalline manner. The non-inflammatory arthroses include osteoarthritis, neuropathic arthropathies, rheumatic fever, ochronosis, and pulmonary hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. Um, osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease is the single most common clinical entity in orthopedics. Um, virtually any adult field you go into is going to be de spend a lot of time dealing with osteoarthritis. Um, Y'all are all familiar with it. Uh, progressive loss of articular cartilage. Pathologically, you see an attempt at repair and remodeling, subchondral sclerosis and cyst, and marginal osteophytes. Um, a picture of osteoarthritis showing the worn off bone with the little buds of granulation tissue trying to heal. Um, the cartilage surface is... Um, uh, split and cracked. Um, I don't have a slide of it, but a very commonly asked question that you're going to have to to know about is the difference in healing superficial and deep cartilage wounds. Uh, the superficial wounds, by and large, don't heal. Um, I don't know how people teach arthroscopy. It must be the hardest thing imaginable to do. But all of those little scuffs that you guys put in 20-year-old athletes' knees with the arthroscope, and your attending is cringing. Um, they stay there presumably forever. Now, they don't lead to degenerative arthritis, but they don't heal. Uh, deep wounds to cartilage create a granulation tissue response. People form a various amount of fibrocartilage, which is inferior mechanically to hyaline cartilage. Subchondral cysts are a coalition of granulation tissue that is made in an attempt by the body to um, heal the um, arthritic um, condition. Um, there are, is primary and secondary arthritis, um, primary the most common in which there's not a known um, inciting incident. Uh, secondary, there is a known 
injury infection or some reason to have it. Uh, the incidence obviously goes up with age. Uh, there is a defect in the cartilage matrix in primary osteoarthritis involving the type 2 um, collagen. There are um, theorized defects in the subchondral bone is another etiology in terms of the shape being different or the subchondral bone being stiffer. And clearly, as you know, people who have um, even minor degrees of dysplastic hips have a higher instance of development of osteoarthritis. The biomechanical Biochemical alterations are also popularly asked questions. There is a decrease in the proteoglycan content and an increase in the water content. There's an increase in the percentage of chondroitin relative to keratin sulfate. Proteoglycan synthesis actually is increased in um, osteoarthritis, but less so than the rate of breakdown, thus the um, progressive loss of articular cartilage. Uh, the pathology is fibrillation, cracking, erosions, loss of cartilage. Um, one sees cloning of chondrocytes. There's an increased amount of um, cell division, which um, results in some new proteoglycan synthesis, which can be stained for. There is new bone deposition. The um, subchondral bone is thickened. Uh, the surface of the joint gets polished. The name for that is ebernation. Buds of fibrocartilage originate in the subchondral bone. Granulation tissue forms as a healing response. It undergoes myxoid degeneration, leading to the, leading to the formation of the subchondral or degenerative cyst. Um, osteophytes are a common accompaniment of osteoarthritis um, and are not as commonly seen in the inflammatory um, arthritis. Again, the, the thickening of the subchondral bone with the complete loss of the um, uh, cartilage layer, but really not much true inflammatory response. There are changes in the synovium in people with osteoarthritis. There's edema and inflammation. The inflammatory cells tend to be chronic inflammatory cells, which are lymphocytes and plasma cells as, acute, as a, opposed to polys. Uh, there is thickening and fibrosis of the um, cartilage. Uh, there is a synovitis that is caused by um, the um, cartilage um, coming into the joint. It, it creates a... Uh, synovial inflammation, and some of this cartilage can um, continue to um, proliferate and survive and form a loose body. Uh, clinically, um, there is an insidious onset of pain and stiffness. It tends to be worse early. People tend to get better some as the day goes on, at least early into the disease, and gets uh, worse again at night. There is a decreased range of motion and a unpredictable but generally gradual increase in pain as time goes by. X-ray shows a narrowed joint. The narrowing often is asymmetric as opposed to symmetric in the inflammatory arthritis. The loss of cartilage tends to be um, axial. There is subchondral sclerosis, whereas in the inflammatory arthritis there tends to be osteoporosis. There are marginal osteophytes and subchondral cyst. So that x-rays, classic for um, arthritis, uh, showing narrowing um, of the basal joint of the thumb, a very common target joint, osteophytes, um, and um, the bone is not um, uh, osteopenic. Uh, axial narrowing of the um, joint space as opposed to the central narrowing that's commonly seen in the inflammatory arthritis. And sort of a granddaddy subchondral cyst in a patient with osteoarthritis um, showing the um, irregularity of the joint space, speaking of the spines, and this um, uh, lytic lesion which was a geode or subchondral cyst. Uh, there are some patterns of distribution uh, in men. It's common in the hips and relatively mild in the um, spine. Bad knee arthritis is seen um, 
in obese, hypertensive females, and I don't know how y'all's university is, but boy, at our universities, it seems like there's an awful lot of um, these people getting knee replacements. Um, we um, look at the young, or not young, but the thin, in-shape female without this, these huge varus deformities and call them a St. Mary's knee after the local hospital. Um, but th this seems to be um, a, a very common presentation. Uh, it can occur in a generalized form. Uh, this is most common in women. It tends to be familial, and there is some um, HLA um, antigen um, uh, concurrence. I've not seen the mask this yet. But in women um, who get inflammatory arthritis of the hands um, with these Heberden's nodes or swellings around the um, distal joints, um, generalized osteoarthritis um, can mimic to some degree inflammatory arthritis. And this is an example of someone with generalized osteoarthritis with osteophytes, joint narrowing, the swelling of the joints called um, Heberden's nodes. Spondylosis deformans is the spinal counterpart of degenerative arthritis. Uh, cervical and lumbar spines are most common, as you know. Uh, there are subchondral sclerosis, the disc narrows, um, there are osteophytes, traction spurs are formed at the um, anterior longitudinal ligament insertion site, and Schmorl's nodes are um, common. And examples of common osteoarthritis of the spine. For those of you in general orthopedics and in spines, it will be possibly the most common thing that you um, bump into on a um, daily basis. Uh, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis um, is a bony proliferation that occurs at tendon and ligament insertions. It is very common in old men. Um, they often don't hurt much, but complain of a lot of stiffness, especially spinal. Um, it's associated with obesity and adult onset diabetes mellitus. Um, the uh, tendon and ligament insertion site, um, uh, bony overgrowth, and the spines can become um, very stiff. Uh, generally not a surgical entity. Neuropathic joints is something that gets asked all the time um, and is something that you should expect to bump into. There's joint destruction with marked fragmentation of the bone or massive osteophytes. Uh, classically associated with Tabes dorsalis, we don't see much now, uh, but now very commonly associated with diabetes, especially in the foot. In the upper extremity, think about syringomyelia or um, leprosy or Hansen's disease, um, also associated um, with um, alcoholics. Um, the x-rays of the foot show this marked deformity in osteophyte formation. X-ray of the knee um, showing the gross destruction much more than you expect from um, uh, normal arth arthritic knee should lead you to at least think about it. This is a patient that I've treated in the last two weeks who um, presented with marked destruction of his shoulder. If you look closely, there's some um, bone changes down here. Another surgeon thought he was infected, debrided him, sent the pathology, was read as osteosarcoma, both at the local hospital and at a world-famous um, uh, referral center. Um, I looked at the x-rays and just didn't like it for osteosarcoma. Um, told my pathologist I just didn't like it for that. Sent it off to Dr. Dorfman in New York, who's sort of currently the guru, and he agreed with me that this looks like a... Um, uh, Charcot joint, MRI to his neck, he had kind of a funny looking hand and he's got a syrinx. Um, and um, the, was read as osteosarcoma, I say, at one of the best two or three known places in the world, a frightening thing. But when things don't fit, you need to, to recognize and think about things not fitting. I did my fellowship with Dr. Anna King and he used to laugh at orthopedists, said that if you get an x-ray, you go look at it. 
And if you don't like the way the radiologist read the x-ray, you go beat them over the head and tell them you don't like it. But if you get a path report, you guys think it's etched in stone. And it is every bit as much of an art as looking at an x-ray is. And so when things don't fit, question them. Um, neuropathic joint etiology it has a couple of different um, uh, presumptive um, etiologies, loss of the protective function of pain or a neural mediated vascular um, reflex. Um, and these are not mutually exclusive. Acute rheumatic fever, you know they've asked about this on in training and I'm not sure I, I think it's important enough in an orthopedic perspective to do that, but, but they, um, they do ask about it. Um, so we need to at least mention it. Used to be common. And people my age who watched cardiac surgery grow up used to see four, five, six valves a week being done by a cardiac surgeon. Now you see a valve on the schedule and you kind of go, wow. Um, and most of that was from people who'd had rheumatic fever. It used to be a big, big, big entity. It's due to an untreated strep infection. Uh, carditis was the worst of the um, uh, clinical, clinical manifestations. It presented with a skin rash and with subcutaneous nodules and a migratory large joint um, arthritis. The ASO level is elevated in about 80% of people. There are Jones criteria, and that's what I've seen asked recently, um, which requires a strep infection with either two major or one major and two minor criteria. And the criteria you should at least recognize, um, even if you don't remember the formula. And they have the major carditis, polyarthritis, chorea or funny movements, erythema marginatum, and sub-Q nodules. The minor criteria are fever, arthralgia, a history of rheumatic fever, an elevated SED rate, and a prolonged PR interval on electrocardiography. Ochronosis seems to show up on in-training about every four years. Um, also called alcaptonuria. It is a defect in homogentistic acid um, metabolism. Uh, excessive homogentistic acid uh, gets deposited in the joints. Uh, the cartilage turns black. It um, degenerates early. Uh, commonly associated um, with um, back pain and disc space narrowing. Um, Y'all won't, but I always remember this because in Dr. Enna King's uh, course, his um, picture of ochronosis was in a guy that was electrocuted in the um, Florida electric chair. And we always wondered how he knew that was ochronosis and not something else. Um, but it shows up. Uh, there is this um, staining um, in the um, synovial fluid if you happen to draw it and look at it. And if you see it arthroscopically, the cartilage is black. Hypertrophic osteoarthropathy shows up regularly on in-trainings. Almost always the secondary osteoarthropathy is what they're interested in. It's associated with clubbing of digits, periosteal new bone formation, painful swollen joints, and chronic lung diseases. The classic lung disease is bronchogenic carcinoma. And that's the one they tend to ask about. But it can occur in a bunch of other um, lung diseases, and this is a test question that they um, like. There is a primary hypertrophic osteoarthropathy that is showing up in all the books now, so it's going to bound to show up on the test soon. It's much less common. It occurs in adolescent black men. They have enlarged hands and feet because of this dactylitis or periosteolum new bone formation, and it is not associated with lung diseases. The secondary form occurs in 5 to 10 percent of people with lung cancers. Um, clubbing of the fingers and toes, but you generally get asked to see them because they hurt. And if you're in an institution like mine, you can't get a rheumatologist to see somebody, but you can get orthopedics to come by. So you get um, consulted on people who have this on occasion. Um, the bones have periosteal um, new bone um, formation, um, and if it's possible to eliminate the underlying problem, the new bone formation tends um, 
not to be um, uh, progressive. And this is for me. I've been talking so long, I think my throat is getting a blister. Um, inflammatory arthritis. Um, again, this is something you're going to see on the test. There's going to be um, one or more questions on every test you ever take on the inflammatory arthritis. Um, they include a number of things that are important to orthopedists. Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, the spondyloarthropathies arthropathies and gout especially. Um, but I get referred um, an old guy with polymyalgia rheumatica virtually every year. It, it's not a dime a dozen, but I don't have a general orthopedic practice, so somebody who is out in the world in a, ju in a general orthopedic practice is going to see even more of that. Rheumatoid arthritis is the most common inflammatory arthritis, the classic inflammatory arthritis. It occurs in 1% of white people. Women are twice as likely to get it as men. Uh, there is a um, genetic predisposition with a human lymphocyte antigen abnormality that is common, and it has nine times the expected incidence in identical twins, so there is some uh, genetic predisposition to rheumatoid arthritis. Occurs in relatively young people. Um, they present with generalized fatigue, weakness, and joint pain. These people feel sick. The um, larger joints of the hand and fingers are usually the first affected joints, so that the MPs and PIPs are where it's generally picked up first. Uh, every joint um, can um, get involved with it as time goes by. The rheumatoid factor is the most helpful diagnostic test present in 80% of people with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, this is a test question constantly. It is an IgM immunoglobulin. Um, it is um, uh, an autoantibody directed against the FC fragment of IgG. It is present in other paths that we're going to look at, and some normal people have um, rheumatoid factors. So it is not absolutely diagnostic, but is certainly um, suggestive. It is also seen in Sjogren's syndrome and um, sarcoidosis in, in lupus. Um, I don't know that we come back to this, so we'll do it now. HLA-27 is seen in the seronegative spondyloarthropathies, and you will get asked that regularly. And ANA is seen in systemic lupus, Sjogren's, and scleroderma with systemic lupus being the uh, disease of major orthopedic import. Uh, the etiology of rheumatoid arthritis is not known. It's possibly infectious. It clearly involves a T-cell mediated immune response uh, with antibodies directed against normal tissues. The synovial changes include edematous fronds, hyperplasia of the synovium, uh, CD4 positive T lymphocytes are common. Uh, also, plasma cells, macrophages, and um, the cytotoxic T cells are seen. Um, fibrinoid necrosis of these synovial fronds uh, leads to the deposition in the joints of little white bodies that look like rice nodules called rice bodies. The articular cartilage changes are secondary to the synovial inflammation as opposed to being primary changes as seen in osteoarthritis. Uh, granulation tissue covers the cartilage. Um, various cytokines and collagenases are elaborated. The um, cartilage gets destroyed. As the cartilage is completely destroyed, the disease tends to burn out, uh, leaving a um, stiff fibrotic joint. Subchondral bone changes um, include inflammatory cells um, in the subchondral bone. These often are contiguous with the synovium. Of particular importance and something that shows up regularly is diffuse osteopenia, so that one of the hallmarks of a rheumatoid x-ray is the periarticular osteopenia, which you don't tend to see in the non-inflammatory arthritis. 
Uh, the pathology is inflammation. Um, there's hypertrophy of the synovial villi, lymphoid aggregates, and um, enlarged vessels that can be seen. Um, the, um, the cell type is inflammatory as opposed to neoplastic. Uh, most are chronic inflammatory cells, as I noted earlier, lymphocytes and plasma cells, as opposed to the acute inflammatory cells that you would expect to see in gout or septic arthritis. Um, there is a little entity that was asked once upon a time on one of the tests called a Russell body, which is an immunoglobulin-rich um, plasma cell cytoplasm that is characteristic for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, as time goes by, uh, panis covers the joint and the um, cartilage is destroyed. The subchondral bone um, gets invaded with granulation tissue. Um, and um, leads to destruction of the bone. X-ray is joint narrowing with marginal erosions um, as opposed to the subchondral cyst of, of degenerative arthritis, which are not uh, generally marginal. Uh, the joint narrowing tends to be diffuse rather than focal so that the varus deformity seen in DJD is not commonly seen or wouldn't be expected with rheumatoid arthritis. And there is the periarticular osteopenia, which is an x-ray characteristic. Um, erosive arthritis is um, commonly seen here at the um, joint margin with the periarticular um, osteopenia. Um, the spine is commonly asked in rheumatoid arthritis. I assume that Dr. Lowerman covered that in the spine lectures. C12 instability and subaxial instabilities are the um, processes that will be looked for. Uh, systemic lupus um, occurs primarily in black women. It is an inflammatory arthritis of unknown etiology. It's not as destructive as rheumatoid arthritis. The um, primary mortality in systemic lupus is renal. It is associated with a positive ANA test or any nuclear antibody and sometimes has a positive rheumatoid factor. Um, joint involvement is common. Patients like rheumatoid patients are systemically ill with a fever, uh, butterfly rash on the face, um, pericarditis, um, nephritis. Both um, entities are primarily treated medically. Um, don't know how well the butterfly rash um, scanned into the um, computer, but that is common um, with um, systemic lupus, uh, as are these inflammatory um, joint changes. Polymyalgia rheumatica is common in older people. It presents as proximal muscle weakness and stiffness so that people feel weak around the shoulders and hips. They also tend to feel generally ill. Um, headaches are a common accompaniment. Um, temporal arteritis is um, commonly associated with it and is often a means of making the diagnosis to actually biopsy the temporal artery. It's associated with an elevated sedimentation rate and um, alkaline phosphatase. Uh, the muscles can become very inflamed on MRI scanning um, and um, suggest infections and even at times tumors. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is asked on in-training essentially every year. Uh, it's the most common rheumatologic disorder of children. Most are seronegative as opposed to um, adults who are 80% seropositive. 90% of children with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis are not seropositive. There are more systemic manifestations with JRA than are common with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, many children with JRA recover completely, but many don't. Uh, there are a variety of forms. Um, the posse articular is the most common. It occurs 55 to 75 percent of the time. It involves four or fewer joints. If it involves five joints, it doesn't qualify for pos posse articular. It is common in young children. The knee is the most common joint. 
and it's associated with um, eye problems, which um, has been um, asked on one of the um, tests um, not in the not too distant past. Um, polyarticular JRA is about 20% of the cases. These are the ones who are most likely to have a positive rheumatoid factor. Uh, involves five or more joints. It also is associated with systemic findings. Um, prognosis for polyarticular is better than for polyarticular in terms of long-term joint destruction. Systemic onset JRA is about the same um, commonness as polyarticular. It's the most serious form. Um, involves a variety of um, organs, including the um, liver, spleen, heart, and lung. About 50% of these people will develop um, progressive arthritic um, changes as time goes by. X-ray of JRA um, uh, is reminiscent in some ways of adults. There is periarticular osteoporosis. Uh, there is um, uh, relatively symmetric joint space narrowing. Uh, it is associated with some constriction of the um, bony diaphyses uh, and is associated with epiphyseal enlargement or um, ballooning. Uh, the other um, x-ray presentation, again, the periarticular osteoporosis common in both the adult and children's forms, uh, sometimes a growth recovery line uh, and metaphyseal um, sclerosis with what often looks like some widening of the epiphysis seen in children with JRA. Uh, the spine involvement in JRA is common. It's a little bit different than the spine involvement in adult arthritis. They tend to become ankylosed with long, thin um, vertebrae the um, classic um, x-ray picture of the JRA spine. Seronegative spondyloarthropathies are uncommon but not rare. Uh, general orthopedists and spine surgeons are going to see these people. Uh, they tend to occur in relatively younger people. There are a variety of them, including ankylosing spondylitis, Reiter syndrome, psoriatic arthritis, and arthritis associated with inflammatory bowel disease. They tend to be variably HLA B27 positive and rheumatoid factor negative. Um, ankylosing spondylitis is the most common one. Um, possible association with a couple of organisms, Klebsiella and Yersinia. Um, Two-thirds of people have spinal involvement only. Enthesopathies or inflammations at tendon and ligament insertions are commonly associated with the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Um, they sometimes get uh, exuberant reactive bone formation or even an erosion at ligament insertions. Uh, bony osteophytes bridge the vertebral body at a um, location that is even with the body as opposed to osteoarthritis where the osteophytes um, protrude. Flexion deformities are common. Stiffness is common. They're associated with very difficult cervical spine fractures with, um, that are hard to treat and have high morbidities. Um, The peripheral joint pathology is inflammatory, similar to rheumatoid arthritis, um, associated with protrusio in the hips, and there are a variety of um, systemic manifestations. Most are males. Average age is young. 90% are um, HLA-27 positive, and the SED rate is elevated in a large majority. The sacroiliac joint is usually involved, um, and I make a plea with my residents when they are um, seeing patients and getting spine x-rays to try to look at everything but the spine first. Uh, if you focus right in on the spine, you overlook other things like blinking owl signs with metastatic disease, kidney stones, and sacroiliac joint involvement that you see with um, 
uh, the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Um, the course is variable. Most people do okay. Um, they're stiff, they're sore, but, but are functional. Uh, some people get very, very um, stiff um, uh, and um, are, are significantly disabled. You all are, have seen the pictures in the textbooks of people who are bent forward with their chin almost on their knees. Um, uh, Osteotomy is often required to correct the um, deformities. Again, the bamboo spine and ankylosing spondylitis and the sacroiliac joint erosions um, in my role as tumor surgeon. The other thing is this is an area where you see tumors. Chondrosarcomas I've seen there on several occasions. And so when you order a spine film, look at areas other than the spine. Um, Writer syndrome, um, conjunctivitis, uveitis, and arthritis. Uh, there's some eponym that I can't remember. They can't see, they can't pee, and they can't do something associated with the arthritis that, that um, help, helps to remember it. Climb a tree, there you go. Can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree, there you go. Uh, which I think is helpful to remember some of this stuff. It's associated with a skin lesion. Uh, generally, when they ask us about it on examinations, it's associated with heel pain, but they generally give some of this other history. Uh, the arthritis is abrupt and inflammatory. Um, HLA-27, largely positive, but less so. In, than in ankylosing spondylitis. Again, the sacroiliac joint is a commonly involved joint. Um, and here is a picture of someone with massive um, new bone formation around tendon and ligament insertions uh, with Reiter's syndrome. Uh, this is a picture of the keratoderma blenorragicum, the um, skin lesion that is seen. I've never seen them ask you guys to identify that, but looking at the picture kind of sometimes helps you remember it. Uh, psoriasis is relatively common, 1 to 2 percent of the population. 5 percent of those people develop arthritis. Only 50 percent of people with psoriatic arthritis are HLA B27 positive. So we've diminished from 90 percent in ankylosing spondylitis to 80 in writers to 50 in psoriatic. You're going to see and treat some people with psoriatic arthritis. And I'm sure most of you guys in joint and women in joint replacement centers uh, have seen people with bad psoriasis right where you want to make an incision, usually more for a knee than a hip replacement, but these plaques are common in the back near a posterior hip incision, and they are a pain because they are associated with a much higher rate of developing infection in the joint if you can't um, get the skin lesion under control. Uh, they are commonly associated with um, hand involvement, with sausage-shaped um, digits. The hand lesions can be severe, um, and about a quarter of people with psoriatic arthritis uh, have involvement of the sacroiliac joint. A uh, picture of a person with the sausage digit um, destruction. The distal joint is classic for psoriatic arthritis as opposed to rheumatoid preferring the MPs and PIPs and erosions of the calcaneus at the area of plantar fascia and erosive um, uh, bone destruction as opposed to the writers that we looked at, which could also have been erosive, showing the bone formation. Enteropathic arthritis occurs in 10 to 20 percent of people with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. It tends to be non-deforming and consequently not a surgical issue. It tends to be large joints. Uh, familiarity so that you recognize it is um, important because you be, may be asked to see people with um, painful swollen joints and in your um, uh, history find out they have Crohn's disease and you may be more likely to recognize that than the um, standard family practitioner um, is. 50% um, HLA-B27 positive. Um, gout. Uh, those of you who do adult in general orthopedics are going to see gout. Uh, it's relatively common. Uh, people show up hurting like crazy in your office or in the emergency room. Uh, they get an inflammatory arthritis due to tissue deposition of monosodium urate crystals. 
Uh, uric acid is the final breakdown product of purine bases. Um, they often will have hyperuricemia, chronic renal failure, um, various um, gall, gallbladder and kidney stones. Uh, most of the people who are hyperuricemic have some decreased renal clearance. Um, people show up with sudden pain, swelling, and redness, looks infected very commonly. Um, podagra, or the um, MP joint of the big toe, is the classic location, but certainly not the only location. A lot of people with an acute inflammatory arthritis from gout have a history uh, and makes the diagnosis easier, but they don't all. And um, some of the people you see may have a history but not be um, intelligent enough to be able to help you with that. Um, TOFI, or collections of urate crystals, generally occur as late sequelae and generally are not a diagnostic difficulty. Gouty x-ray early shows soft tissue swelling. You may have periarticular soft tissue densities. Bone erosions tend to be periarticular with a sclerotic rim. Uh, gouty arthritis tends to lack the periarticular osteoporosis. Uh, joint space tends to be preserved, helping to um, differentiate it radiographically from rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, classic gouty x-ray of um, podagra with um, marginal erosion. Here another erosion with a um, sclerotic um, rim of um, bone, which you might well not see in a rheumatoid erosion. Again, negative birefringence, long needle-shaped crystals. Um, and again, this picture is taken um, from uh, one of the self-assessment exams um, and is something that you should expect to bump into very likely. Um, treatment is acute and chronic. The acute treatment is, um, if people can tolerate it, a non anti-inflammatory drug of which indomethacin seems to work particularly well. Uh, it inhibits um, phagocytosis of these gouty crystals. Colchicine inhibits inflammatory mediators. They both have um, gastrointestinal problems. As you know, indocin can give you heartburn and ulcers. Colchicine can make people um, deathly nauseated. Allopurinol is the chronic treatment. Is It is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Um, if given acutely, it may potentiate the acute attack, but on a long-term basis in people who maintain elevated levels of um, uric acid um, is the mainstay of treatment. Um, diet modifications also are um, used. Chondrocalcinosis or um, calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease um, is common in old people. Um, uh, it tends to involve an older population than um, uh, gout does. Um, calcium pyrophosphate crystals um, form adjacent to the chondrocyte. They're shed into the joint and seed other tissues. 6% of people over 70 will have radiographic evidence of um, chondrocalcinosis. Many people are asymptomatic. Um, Pseudogout, as it is sometimes called, is the most common acute arthritis in older people. Chronic pyrophosphate um, arthropathy mimics osteoarthritis. Um, one can get tophaceous pseudogout um, where the um, crystals form periarticular soft tissue masses, but again, they're calcium pyrophosphate, not monosodium urate crystals. Uh, the x-ray is chondrocalcinosis, joint space narrowing, and subchondral sclerosis, so that the classic x-ray that you've all seen is um, calcification within the menisci and the knee or within commonly the triangular fibrocartilage of the um, wrist. Uh, the crystals we looked at earlier are positively birefringent and different shaped than gout crystals. Um, it's also associated with an entity called the Milwaukee shoulder, 
which is a relatively acute destructive arthritis of the shoulder that is sometimes associated, and that sure is terrible, but sometimes associated with um, uh, calcium pyrophosphate crystals visible on x-ray. Infectious arthritis is critical to recognize and be aware of. Um, if you miss calcium pyrophosphate disease for a, a week or two or a month, it doesn't make much difference. If you miss a pyogenic arthritis, uh, clearly that will lead to joint destruction. A variety of infectious arthritises exist, um, all of which will be touched on. Pyogenic arthritis occurs as a result of hematogenous spread, contiguous osteomyelitis, remember the hip in children, and puncture wounds. It is less common than osteomyelitis, but is rapidly destructive to articular cartilage. Uh, it is possible to see chondrocyte death within 48 hours of initiation of pyogenic arthritis. Um, may progress even in the absence of apparently viable bacteria. Remember the glycocalyx again. Um, it doesn't necessarily require a metallic surface. Um, and occasionally extensive synovectomies will be done on patients who have um, recalcitrant pyogenic arthritis. Presents as an acute painful swollen joint. Uh, white blood cells usually significantly greater than 50,000. Uh, if less than that, you really wonder about the diagnosis. 80% polys, culture and sensitivity in pyogenic arthritis, much more likely to be positive than in a septic um, replaced joint. Glucose and LDH are not distinctive. Uh, as many as 10 to 20% can be polyarticular. Um, there are predispositions. Um, rheumatoid patients um, are um, more likely um, to um, get it. IV drug abusers, remember the sacroiliac and sternoclavicular joints. That's a commonly asked um, question. Prosthetic joints um, uh, get infected both acutely and late. Uh, the late infection is a heartbreaking thing. Uh, people with systemic illnesses are predisposed to it. Children uh, and elderly patients for some reason have a predisposition to the shoulder, which often um, is initially overlooked. Staph aureus is the most common bug. Um, uh, Often see methicillin resistant staph with IV drug abusers. Um, any organism basically can do it. Uh, think about Pasteurella in cats and dogs. Um, Haemophilus, not so much with immunization anymore, but in young children. And brucellosis, particularly in um, farmers and meat packers. Sacroiliac joint and spine are common joints for um, brucellosis. And that got asked on in training in the not too distant past. Uh, the um, x-ray changes is a symmetric um, arthritis with destruction of the bone. You'd like to pick it up before then. Uh, treatment is incision and drainage, uh, possibly a synovectomy in recalcitrant uh, disease, and appropriate antibiotics. Um, accessible joints can be washed out and debrided arthroscopically. Accessible joints like the knee even can be treated uh, with multiple aspirations and antibiotics. Uh, and as an orthopedist, I know I'm prejudiced, but you know, it sometimes hurts to go to a medicine floor and see somebody that has 30 needle sticks in their knee where they've been aspirating it every day for two weeks because they want to save them an operation. Um, you wonder which the more aggressive um, treatment is. Um, gonococcal arthritis is something that um, you're likely to bump into if you're doing emergency room coverage. This is a common source of polyarticular arthritis um, associated with tenosynovial inflammation and dermatitis. Obviously, you think about it in young, um, sexually active um, people. Uh, culture and sensitivity uh, is positive. 
in a variable um, number of people, some of which is due to the fact that it's hard to culture. And you have to remember to get the appropriate culture uh, media if you're going to um, aspirate a joint and um, uh, uh, try to grow gonococcus or have ready access to your lab uh, where you can get to the lab tech and be sure that they appropriately um, plate it. Um, uh, obviously um, commonly cultured from the genitourinary tract. Um, generally treated with drugs and the response is generally dramatic and if you don't get a dramatic response you question your diagnosis. Tuberculous arthritis is a commonly asked question. There's been some resurgence of tuberculosis um, in recent years associated with the immunocompromised population. Uh, occurs in joints from hematogenous spread uh, in the spine called Pott's disease, um, most commonly monoarticular and um, in um, peripheral joints most common in the lower extremities. Uh, it is increasing with immigration in the country associated with immunocompromised um, and malnourished people. The diagnosis can be difficult. Uh, one, you don't tend to think about it. The infection is relatively uh, indolent. Constitutional symptoms may be very subtle. And skin test, even if you do think about it, may not be absolutely accurate. Um, X-rays are not necessarily characteristic. Uh, spondylitis is a common manifestation, but it also presents as osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, and um, abscesses. Um, in an inner city population like I serve, um, we drain a tuberculous abscess every few months. If you are out in a... Um, uh, middle class um, hospital, you're not likely to bump into as much of it. It's treated with multiple drugs. I don't believe that they will ask specifics about the drugs, uh, but there are reasons for the usage of the multiple drugs. Uh, the disease is having a tendency to become more, more virulent with multi-drug resistance um, increasing. Other mycobacteria occur. Uh, the one that they seem to like the best is Mycobacterium marinum, which I talked about um, earlier under infections, occurs uh, in marine environments. Um, if you're in the middle of America, you're not as likely to see this. Uh, Mycobacterium avium associated with HIV and Mycobacterium leprae or leprosy, uh, remember a uh, common cause of neuropathic joints in the upper extremity is usually the way that um, it is looked for. Tuberculosis ideally has a positive PPD, they don't all. When you operate on someone with an abscess, um, you, you need to be sure that you get all of the information that you want to get. And you get a lot more information when you ask for it than you get when you expect it. So that if you suspect tuberculosis and you're sending gram stains and stuff, you really need to bother to make the phone call to your lab tech who's doing this and ask them to think about it. Because like you, they don't think about it very often. The organisms are fairly small and relatively easy to overlook um, and you will get more information out if you put more information in. Cultures take weeks and weeks to um, grow and ideally you'd like to make the diagnosis um, before the culture takes place. It's a granulomatous infection under the microscope. There is necrosis or caseation which is commonly um, seen. X-ray is not um, diagnostic. Um, uh, there is bone destruction, joint space narrowing. It occurs in the anterior aspect of the spine, uh, can present as abscesses. Uh, there is nothing diagnostic about these particular X-rays, but they show a destructive arthritis that you certainly would um, consider 
uh, as a septic arthritis and in an appropriate population, TB should cross your mind. Again, there are granulomas. There are long Hans giant cells. These are giant cells with multiple nuclei that are peripheral as opposed to the osteoclast-like giant cell that you commonly see in tumors, which has multiple central nuclei. This is different than the Langerhan cell histiocytosis. There is no ER um, in this. Um, treatment of tuberculosis is surgical debridement and antibiotics. Fungal arthritis is relatively rare. There are some areas of the country, for those of you who are in them, you know, that are in various fungal belts. Um, it's usually diagnosed by pathology or culture. Uh, uh, if you're in a fungal belt, your pathologist will probably be smart enough to stain for the organisms. But if you're not and you're seeing funny looking granulomas, you need to ask them to do that. Uh, Common in immunocompromised um, people, um, arthritis is less common than fungal osteomyelitis. Um, what you usually will see in clinical practice is candidiasis in the very sick immunocompromised hospital patient, but the fungal arthritis occur in neonates, HIV positive people, and drug abusers. Um, coccidioidomycosis is common in the southwestern United States. Um, people from Arizona and the like, I'm sure, have seen that. We would be shocked to bump into one of those in Virginia. Um, blastomycosis, um, common in central and south central um, United States. Um, these people often are ill and joint and bone involvement is much less common than the constitutional involvement. Sporotrichosis um, is seldom seen, but commonly enters a differential diagnosis consideration. Um, I have a funny practice in that I see a lot of lumps, but I see a lot of upper extremity lumps, and among the things that you think about are um, lymphadenopathy from cat scratch disease or sporotrichosis, commonly called drunken rose gardener um, disease, um, and seen in people who um, work agriculturally or um, uh, do a lot of gardening. Candida is the common bug. Um, it is um, relatively common in big hospitals with sick patients. Um, associated with immunocompromised host and central lines. It is not a granulomatous disease like the other fungal diseases are, but it is stainable and in the right person should be something that crosses your mind. Lyme disease, they like. Um, it's associated with the deer tick as opposed to the dog tick. Uh, Northeast United States is the most common um, location. Commonly missed, um, presents with um, a variety of clinical symptoms, including um, a rash, Bell's palsy, and cardiac symptoms um, associated um, with an inflammatory um, arthritis, which is not generally an early manifestation. You can test for it, improve the diagnosis, and it um, is treated with antibiotics. Hemorrhagic effusions is the last thing we're going to look at today. Um, thank heavens for all of us. Um, associated with hemophilia, sickle cell disease, and pigmented villanodular synovitis. Um, hemophilia you probably will see a lot of or almost none of. Um, uh, if you do sports medicine and joint replacements, um, you uh, and develop a friendship with um, a pediatric hematologist, you may see a lot more hemophilia than you want to see. If you don't do that, you will hardly see it. Uh, generally, the patients know they have it before they present with an effusion. Sickle cell disease um, and pigmented villanodular synovitis will also look at. Hemophilia is an X-linked recessive disorder. 
generally a factor VIII deficiency with a variant hemophilia B being a factor IX deficiency or Christmas disease. Presents with hemarthrosis, synovitis, and joint destruction. Can also present um, with subperiosteal bleeds and very, very funny looking bones. Um, uh, one of the funniest things I ever watched was Dr. Enneking at his course presented a hemophiliac pseudotumor to somebody and he taught the way I prefer to, which is firing questions and getting answers as opposed to lecturing. And this guy went down the primrose path, thought it was a osteosarcoma, amputated the leg um, in conference. Uh, Dr. Enneking then told him it was hemophiliac pseudotumor and says, now what? And the guy says, well, I'm going to sew it back on. And um, he, Dr. Anna King is a, a tough man to poke fun at, you know, big, tall, athletic guy, um, and he just howled at that. So remember the hemophiliac pseudotumor. The severity of the disease is related to the degree of factor deficiency. Knee is the most commonly involved joint, but the ankle is not at all uncommon. Presents with swelling pain and decreased range of motion. Hemophiliacs can get bleeds into their psoas muscle and present with femoral nerve palsies um, is something else to keep in mind. And it hasn't been recently, but sometime over the last 10 years or, ago, that showed up, or so that showed up on an in-training. Uh, the um, joint is symmetrically um, destroyed. Generally, it is not a diagnostic problem. You are unlikely as an orthopedist to diagnose hemophilia in the emergency room, but you may well be asked to involve treating it. Uh, treatments involve synovectomies, radiation synovectomies, and joint replacements. Uh, remember that virtually everybody you do a joint replacement on is going to be HIV positive and um, think about protecting yourself and your um, staff even if you don't think they are. Uh, the question that gets asked commonly is factor levels. You should have a hundred percent of the factor level the first week and 50 to 75 percent the um, second week. Very sadly up to 90 percent of these kids are HIV positive. A number of people have an inhibitor and that may inhibit you from being able to do surgery on them. If you can't control their bleeding, you can't operate on them. Sickle cell disease, 1% of um, American, um, African Americans um, associated with bone infarcts and um, periosteal new bone formation, particularly in the hands. A uh, common question is osteomyelitis. Salmonella is the characteristic organism. Staphylococcus is the common organism. This is the dactylitis of sickle cell disease with the periosteal new bone formation, swollen painful digits, uh, and young um, black kids. Um, pigmented villanodular synovitis is an exuberant proliferation of the synovium of unknown etiology. There are hemosiderin deposits within the synovium, presents as pain, swelling, synovitis, and a bloody effusion. Knee is the most common joint involved, but it involves virtually any joint um, uh, at some point, one time or another. Um, I've done toe joints, finger joints, um, so that it can be anywhere. You can create a synovitis in the knee by injecting blood, but the pathology will not be the same as pigmented villanodular synovitis. There are juxtacortical erosions, sclerotic margins to the erosions. It's a slow going process. The pathology shows pigmented synovial histiocytes, foam cells, and giant cells. Treatment is synovectomy. Uh, radiation synovectomy is used but not um, clearly proven. A joint replacement in um, a completely destroyed joints. The cartilage seems to have something to do with this. Um, once the cartilage is all destroyed, the process tends to burn out. Classic x-ray of PVNS with um, erosions on both sides of the joint. Uh, sclerotic rim showing that it is a relatively chronic process. 
comes in a couple of extremity forms. This is a nodular form of pigmented villanodular synovitis. It was not diffuse. The rest of the synovium in that knee looked reasonably good. And here is the diffuse form of pigmented villanodular um, synovitis, uh, showing that the synovium is um, diffusely um, involved. Um, arthroscopically, you see this um, discolored, hypertrophic synovium, often with some arthritic-type bone uh, destruction. Um, arthroscopic synovectomy is certainly a reasonable thing to do. Repeated arthroscopic synovectomies are clearly less morbid than repeated open synovectomies. Um, if you don't feel like you're doing a good job with the arthroscope, then around the knee they require a multiple incision synovectomy. A recent report in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery uh, described four incision synovectomies with a relatively low recurrence rate. Classically, we've done two incision synovectomies. Uh, some joints just are not amenable to sticking uh, an arthroscope into. Uh, the pathology is this villus synovial proliferation with um, hemosiderin, a uh, very thickened um, synovium. And so good luck. I hope you guys do well on the um, test. Um, and I hope this has been helpful. Thank you very much. Any questions? We've got about 20 minutes. <laughs>